This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1083, recorded on January 26, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Um, just briefly on the weather, it's grotty outside. It's kind of foggy. It's in the low 40s, high 30s. Tomorrow is supposed to be a disaster, and Sunday is going to be worse, But uh, so we should enjoy today. <laughs> it's 8 degrees and cloudy here in New York City. Yeah, it's not pleasant. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's pretty similar here. 38 Fahrenheit, 3 Celsius. It's foggy, drizzly, yeah. black. And, yeah, it's black. Yeah. <laughs> and that's expected to persist for a few days. And from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. It's a little warmer here, but not much <laughs> else is different. Uh, you can tell, actually, experienced listeners can tell what it's like outside because Tinkerbell is not here. <laughs> so it's yeah. cloudy and 55 Viewers degrees. Can tell. Yeah. We've had uh, uh, a, a nice bunch of rain recently, which all of us Texans appreciate. Um, and beyond that, we're just, you know, party along. Party hardy. <laughs> if you enjoy what we do on these science programs, we'd love your financial support because they're essential for us. We don't do ads, if you noticed, to keep it nice and focused. So we are a nonprofit corporation, Microbe TV, and that means in the U.S., your donations are federal U.S. tax deductible. And you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. number of ways we have to help you part with your hard-earned cash. <laughs> We know it's hard-earned, and we appreciate it when you, when you give it to us. As for ASV 2024, this is the last reminder on TWIV before the ASV abstract submission deadline, which is 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time, Thursday, February 1st. Good luck, everybody else, figuring it out when it is to you. <laughs> So the meeting this year will be in Columbus, Ohio, June 24th through the 28th for students, postdocs, or teachers of undergraduate virology. And if you'd like to apply for a travel award, you can start working on that application. Just do February 6th at midnight Eastern time, not too far away. Students that's, and that's 1900 GMT if, if you want to <laughs> <laughs> oh, correct okay. for the rest of the world. Students and postdocs need to be ASV members, and now would be a good time to submit your membership application. Actually, yesterday would be a good time. Yesterday would have been a great time. Or the day before, to... even. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to do all of these things, you go to ASV.org, and there are links to the membership page, the Travel Awards page, and the ASV 2024 meeting page. And there continues to be a... Research assistant position available in the uh, Amy Rosenfeld lab at the Food and Drug Administration Center for Biologics Evaluation and Re Review to study enteroviruses. And in particular, one of the aspects is cross species anti enterovirus antibodies, how they affect viral pathogenesis. You'll be doing cell culture, you'll be working on animal models. It's all BSL2 work. And we'll have a link to in the show notes where you can get Amy's uh, email and you can find more information. And don't forget to buy Dixon's book, The New City, at depommier.com, D-E-S-P-O-M-M-I-E-R.com. What does it mean, an apple picker? You're muted. See, I told you not to mute yourself. <laughs> I, know, well, I, I, was, I thought I was doing you a favor. <laughs> it means apple trees. Apple trees. No. Apple trees. There's, it's a good they name. dropped an S. I don't know why they dropped the S at the end. That's well, that's, Americans that's, do that. Yeah, we mess you know, up everybody else's language. In, in France, also, you can look my name up in a phone book, and 
when they used to have phone books. Uh, and you can actually find the Parmiers all over the place. Basically. I think there are still I think there are still phone books. There might be. Right. Especially in rural France. <laughs> yes. Maybe. You still have to go like this. <laughs> Depommier.com. Yep. And you can find links to uh, where you can purchase the book. Very, and very I can now I can now confirm that the book is good. So it's uh, a good read. <laughs> and lots of pictures. So you don't and lots it's of not pictures, just not just a wall of text. That's right. That's exactly yes, right. It, but I, as I as I said in my review on Amazon, I, I think Really, the top selling point of this, if you've read stuff about climate change and there's a mm-hmm. substantial literature about it, is that Dixon's book is one of the rare books in that section that is optimistic, yeah. which mm-hmm. just was really eye-opening. Yeah. Like, yeah. wow, you know, we may not be totally hosed, but we got to get on it, but we, <laughs> you bet. this might be solvable. Yeah, the, the so thing is, I appreciated that. I really, I really like the tone. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad because it's not going to take ten years or twenty years or maybe even fifty. It, it might take a hundred or a hundred and fifty years. But considering how long we've been at altering the climate, the last ten thousand years, uh, another hundred and fifty. Who cares what happens during that time? Obviously, everybody cares. But uh, within that time frame, if, if if you decide to do this, of course. Uh, alter the way we actually not the way we live you don't have to do without anything all mm. you have to do is change your building materials change the way we do things change yeah. the way we do things and don't let um people who say we can't do it uh have a way with you because uh there's nothing we can't do when we put our mind to it we know this already i mean look at us look at all of us we all had careers in science we still do we believe in science because science is not a belief system. I even say that in the book. <laughs> and uh, the reason why we're so confident that we could reverse things is because we caused it. Yeah. So we basically know what to do. Uh, Rich, you want to tell us about Jay Nelson? Sure. This is a passing of note. Uh, uh, Jay Nelson has passed away. Um, I did not know Jay personally. Did any of you guys? No, I did not. So, uh, but I know of him, and he is a person of some repute. I'm, we're linking here to a an obituary in uh, Legacy.com written by his family. Uh, that's quite nice, and uh, I've forwarded this to Kathy, who will post it on the ASV in memoriam site. Uh, Jay was uh, got his PhD from Oregon State University in 1980, and microbiology and virology, and did uh, a postdoc at the Fred Hutch as, and was a faculty member at the Scripps Clinic. Um, and in 2001, he was uh, recruited to Oregon Health Sciences University and helped establish and lead the Vaccine and Gene Therapy in- Institute, VGTI, which is an organization of some repute. Uh, his sort of... Uh, a uh, go-to thing is uh, cytomegaloviruses, and there's uh, a lot in this um, uh, uh, obituary about details of what he did, but uh, the thing that uh, uh, attracts my attention mostly is that I think he was a pioneer, if not the pioneer, in using CMV as a vaccine, vaccine vector, which is something that we have uh, talked about uh, here before. Uh, he was also the director of the Pacific Northwest uh, Regional Center of uh, Excellence in Biodefense and Emerging Infectious Diseases. That's a big consortium uh, exercise. Uh, and there is a tribute here to uh, the fact that he was a really nice person, too. Good cl- friend of Klaus Fru, uh, mm-hmm. who was who we interviewed uh, not long ago, uh, who's also at Oregon Health Sciences University. In fact, this uh, notification comes to me indirectly from Klaus through Grant McFadden. So uh, we note and mourn his passing. He was just a month older than me. Wow. All right. In the news, CDC has issued a measles alert. In the U.S. now, there have been 23 cases of measles since December 1st of last year. Of course, the uh, the cases in Philadelphia. There have also been cases in Washington. 
in Virginia, in New Jersey, and in Georgia. And these, of course, are all vaccine preventable. Also, measles outbreaks in Europe and Central Asia went up 3,000% this, this year compared to last year, uh, which is a lot since we're hardly into this year. 30,000 right? confirmed cases um, last year, right? Between January and 5 December. <clears throat> um, oh, up, wait. Yeah. So there were 30,000 confirmed cases in Europe and Central Asia January to December of 2023, up from 909 in 2022. Yeah. Yeah. This is 2023, right? Okay, it's the whole year, not this year. Got it. And. Um, but that's, yeah. I mean, that's a really, really significant increase. The highest you know? <clears throat> rate is in. Kazakhstan with 69 cases per 100,000. That's 13,254 cases. I think immunization rates are very low in these countries. Kyrgyzstan has the second highest rate, 58 cases per 100,000, 3,800. Rumania has a national measles outbreak. Decreases in immunization coverage, a decrease in vaccine demand. Oh, boy, which is in part fueled by misinformation and mistrust, which worsened during and following the COVID-19 pandemic. Latest data show that an estimated 931,000 children in Europe and Central Asia missed or out entirely or partially on routine immunization from 2019 to 2021. So here you are seeing the, um, the fruits of those missings of, of, yeah. of vaccinations. This um, uh, bunch in the U.S., there's, uh, I noticed a six of these cases was in yeah. one family. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. They don't say anything anymore, but I can't imagine that those individuals were vaccinated. So what is the rate of subacute? Um, one, <laughs> one in uh, SSPE. One That's the in, one. What is the rate? One in a, I don't know. You know, I used to say one in a million, but it's, it's more, it's more frequent. So we're going to have a per, we're going to have Roberto Cotanio and people from his lab who have just published a paper to talk okay. about that so we Great. can learn all about it. Very good. All right. Uh, and then um, we have an interesting <laughs> paper in uh, American Journal of Infection Control called Impacts of Lid Closure During Toilet Flushing and of Toilet Bowl Cleaning on Viral Contamination of Surfaces in United States Restrooms. So, uh, you know, when you flush a toilet, it makes an aerosol. And so we have always said, close the toilet lid. But apparently it doesn't help much. <laughs> when you go to the bathroom, you make an aerosol also. <laughs> what do you do? Right. By breathing, yeah. When you wash well, your hands. Well, no, I think well, you're no, by, by anything falling into the water makes an aerosol. Uh, yes, of course, correct. that too. Correct, correct. So they used um, a bacteriophage, bacterium combination, and... Um, <laughs> they added this phage to public <laughs> toilets and household toilets. They flushed with the lid open and down. And basically, uh, you know, when you close the lid, the, uh, the the lid gets phage on it, but it still gets out and covers the floor. And it comes surfaces. out around the edges, apparently, because they find it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. But if you, um, yeah. If you clean the bowl out, uh, you can reduce <laughs> virus by 97%. If you clean it out with, uh, they used hydrochloric acid, which I didn't realize was used as a commercial cleaner, but apparently it is. Well, muriatic, it's called muriatic acid. Yeah, muriatic acid, but it's hydrochloric oh acid. Yeah, you sure. Um, oh my gosh. And that, uh, cleaning out with that gives you a significant reduction. But if you just, they did a, an experiment where they just brushed the inside of the toilet, right? Yeah. <laughs> Without the muriatic acid, and that mm. kind of makes things worse. <laughs> makes things worse. So when it says employees must wash hands before <laughs> returning to their job, um, that they're covered with whatever they uh, encountered when they went. Well, but if you, so if you imagine somebody flushing the toilet and then turning away and washing their hands, presumably they're going to remove a lot of what was just yeah, you should wash shot up hands. into the atmosphere of the 
We definitely and they'll wash. remove anything that got on their hands while they were using the toilet, which is really kind of the point. Yeah, so, you know, some people think it's a miracle that everybody is not dead because <laughs> well, yeah. we're, ex- I, I we're mean, exposed to everything. And, yeah. <laughs> but, but we've got a, what a hell of an immune system here. Yes, we do. We do. And, and the, when it's working, it's great. Yeah. And the half-life of these organisms isn't that great for most of them. Not all of them, but for most of them. Right. But no. the, the hand-washing is is a major additional layer that removes a lot of the opportunity to transmit yeah. these things. Oh, but of course. And, you know, even with the immune system, I'd rather just not get the infection in the first Especially place. Especially if you're a food handler. Yes. Or a doctor. Especially if we're talking about norovirus. Yeah, so it was oh. norovirus that catalyzed these signs in restrooms saying employees must wash their hands because there are so many cases of employees contaminating food with norovirus from the bathroom. So Yeah. I really like uh, some of the numbers here. So they seed the <laughs> water with 10 to the 14th PFU of MS2. Now, it's a little elusive here because I don't know if that's 10 to the 14th total or or whatever. But it gives you it just gives you an idea. And then the wall to the right of the toilet, if I understand the numbers here correctly, show up with slightly in excess of 10 to the 10th PFU. So that's <laughs> 0.01%. Okay. Yeah. When so, you have numbers that big, that's yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Oh, the wall next to the toilet, especially, yeah, that's yeah. just horrible. <laughs> yeah, ten times more, five to ten times more remaining in the toilet bowl water. You get as much, almost as much on the wall as elsewhere. You know, it's yeah. amazing, except for the water itself. And I, I want to point out here that. We're talking about the toilet lid, not the seat. Right. right. Gentlemen are still obligated to leave the seat down. Okay? <laughs> That's right. Doesn't I, doesn't I give you a uh, doesn't give you a free pass. Raise the seat when using, yes. and lower the seat when done. Is I correct. wonder, uh, Alan, on airplanes where it's kind of sucked in, maybe there's less of an aerosol. Ooh, uh, mm, no. good experiment. All right, so um, <laughs> what's going on in an airplane toilet, a uh, modern aircraft toilet when you flush, um, people have this idea that it's opening to the outside and that's why you hear the <laughs> whoosh. That's not what's happening. Uh, it's not going outside, in fact, in cases where the lavatory connection does leak on the outside of the plane. It has caused major aviation disasters because it freezes. Um, wow. But anyway... Uh, so when you flush the toilet, there's a uh, there's a burst of air um, from the cabin pressure system, I think, that shoots alongside um, the inside of the toilet to mm. flush it down. Um, and I'm sure we have airline pilots who can comment, and uh, probably we have lavatory service truck drivers who can comment <laughs> and let us know exactly how the system that's, works. That's right. Um, but what's happening there, I don't think is going to, reliably suck everything down and no, fact, I bet you it might worse. even make yeah. it worse by aerosolizing more yeah. uh but it would be an interesting experiment to do absolutely <laughs> i hope the, these guys are if, listening and they'll go I do remember, the experiment if i remember there's no water in those toilets right no well there's some there's some um fluid comes down the side i think it's right. usually like a disinfecting yeah. fluid that when you comes flush down. it blue it's blue when you flush it yeah when you flush <laughs> it but normally it's not like a regular toilet that has some water no. sitting in there no. yeah. right okay and of uh, course it, a bus toilet is just a porta john right you know it's right. just the the liquid under there and you don't flush cuz there, there's not really so just a hole would you add what would you add to the to the toilet reservoir that would um Lessen your chances of contamination. You can't add anything because muriatic acid. No, it's going to splash. <laughs> it's going to it's going to splash up on you. It's yes, going to burn I, you. I, I, I well, don't do, do that. Well, don't know. please don't put muriatic acid. In your no, they do. Dude. They do talk in the um, uh, in the discussion about how you can buy you know uh, products <laughs> that either hang in your tank or elsewhere or maybe uh, w- whatever. That are disinfecting products. So if you started off with uh, toilet bowl water yeah, that right. had disinfectant in it, of well, course. you need to do the experiment, but yeah, like Clorox uh, or something but like that. might might help out. Maybe. It, yeah, it depends be- on what the disinfectant is. If it's just like a tiny little bit of Lysol with some perfume, I'm not sure. Or Clorox. Clorox would be good. To yeah, have, if actually. you had if you had Clorox in it, sodium hypochlorite. Excuse me. 
<laughs> uh, now we're almost back to muriatic acid. That's right. It's the opposite yin and yang. <laughs> I'm not I mean, sure. The, the, go ahead, well, Rich. Uh, no, I'll uh, strike that comment. It was. <laughs> I mean, was it the some, problem was is it that potty humor. So this, you can this, you can this, uh, clean your home toilet, but the public restrooms are cleaned yeah. less frequently, and so they're more and they are also less likely to have lids. Yes, that's right. Uh, so, Vincent, I have a really important question here. <laughs> okay. Uh-oh. How did you dig this up? <laughs> where, where, where did this come from? Actually, Amy sent it. Amy Rosenfeld oh, okay. sent it to me. Because <laughs> she knows I talk about. Yeah, sure. We've talked uh, about this before. So, uh, the American Journal of Infection Control. I usually don't scan that journal. But uh, it's an interesting article. Yeah. Well, you know where to, you know where to read this article. Wastewater-based epi has demonstrated that almost any human pathogen can be detected in domestic wastewater. Think this about that. True. This is true. It's all coming out. That's right. You know, it's passing through. All right. And Rich, tell us about ingenuity. Uh, so uh, I was <laughs> thinking about making this a pick, but I think it's more a news thing because when this first happened, uh, it was a pick and we had, we had serious discussions about uh, the... Martian helicopter that uh, landed on Mars uh, in the, is that the Curiosity rover? Or no, I forget, doesn't matter. At any rate, uh, landed on Mars like three years ago uh, and was initially, uh, the uh, mission was 30 days long and maybe five flights as an experiment to see how it worked. And that sucker has made 72 missions and lasted over three years well exceeding its uh, expectations, uh, but unfortunately on a recent mission managed to uh, damage its rotors, and so it has become decommissioned. So sayonara ingen- ingenuity, and thank you. It was uh, uh, quite quite an event. Hmm. Quite a ride. Quite a thing, right. yeah. More human pollution on an exoplanet. <laughs> I know, I think about that. <laughs> and that was, that was uh, with the Perseverance rover. Ah, yeah, I was going to say that. Thank you. That's right. All right. Uh, our snippet for today is published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute. It is entitled Invasive Cervical Cancer Incidents Following Bivalent Human Papillomavirus Vaccination, a Population Based Observational Study of Age at Immunization, Dose, and Deprivation. This comes out of Scotland, a number of institutes in Scotland, Palmer, Cavanaugh, Cushieri, Cameron, Graham, Wilson, and Roy. Uh, Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer in women worldwide, and it is caused by infection with human papillomaviruses, small DNA-containing viruses. which uh, we have st- we started to vaccinate against in 2007. In fact, it was Harold Zurhausen who discovered the association of cervical cancer with uh, HPVs, human papillomaviruses, and got the Nobel Prize for that a number of years ago. I believe he passed away last year. And uh, there, are, there are national programs. The UK was one of the first. Um, so uh, there are routine vaccinations given at ages 12 to 13, and there are, there are a number of vaccines that you can get. The first vaccine was called Cervarix, which, which contained two serotypes, HPV 16 and 18, which were the highest association with cervical cancers, uh, and they also gave some cross-protection. Then there was a quadrivalent vaccine released by Merck called Gardasil, uh, which uh, protected against uh, also 16 and 18 and then um, the non-avalent vaccine, nine different serotypes, is, is now used. So, you know, as we vaccinate against the most common serotypes, you see other serotypes popping up that cause less but significant uh, neoplasms. There are <clears throat> hundreds of uh, human papillomavirus serotypes. Uh, first of all, papillomaviruses infect animals throughout nature. Um, in uh, their, uh, I think I would say highly species specific. 
okay, and that the human viruses don't infect other animals. Likewise, other animal papillomaviruses don't infect humans, but within a given species, there can be hundreds of uh, serotypes. Uh, they manifest uh, quite commonly as warts, mm -hmm. uh, and the s different serotypes uh, are associated with specific uh, symptoms. In other words, the serotypes that cause warts on feet are different than the serotypes that cause warts on your hands, um, and these cause, uh, there are, uh, th the cervical dysplasias that people are uh, maybe familiar with that one gets up pap test for mm -hmm. are essentially just flat warts, okay? And quite commonly infection, uh, some, some serotypes uh, are uh, uh, more specific for the for cervical epithelium. Um, and um, uh, usually these infections uh, just happen and resolve sponta uh, uh, spontaneously. Uh, but in a uh, low percentage of uh, cases, there can be an accident. This is not a normal part of the virus's life cycle, but the accident consists of a portion of the viral genome being incorporated into the cellular genome, and this is uh, involved specifically a couple of papillomavirus genes that are there for the purpose of altering the intracellular environment in a fashion that is conducive to virus replication, that is turn on the cell. So when you take those genes and incorporate them into the genome, now you got a cell that's permanently turned on, and the result is cancer. Some serotypes are better at this, the, or more a higher risk at th having this happen uh, than others, 16 and 18, and as has been said, there are some others that are showing up so as, Rich, uh, as well. So, Rich, do we understand why certain serotypes have higher risk for cancer? I don't, and I'm not sure it is understood. No, I, I don't, you know, I've been thinking about this as I read some of these papers now. I'm f uh, far enough out from having been, you know, teaching this stuff and actively employed and going to a lot of meetings so that uh, mm. I'm... I'm not as up to date as I used to be. So it used to be that I could, with confidence, on some of these things, say it is not known. But I don't. <laughs> I'm not yeah. that confident on this. Okay. It may be somewhat, somewhat known. I don't know. <laughs> so known. when I was a, when I was a kid, it was a while back. I can remember being taken to the doctor, and the, my hands had like eight warts on them, and mm -hmm. they just burned them off. Yep. yep. They would burn them off, and they didn't come back. Now. Uh, so this causes cervical cancer in women, but it will also cause uh, anogenital cancer. cancers in men, and it will also call, cause oral cancers because right. of oral That's sex, right? Because right? right. the virus can go from the genital tract. So these are serious cancers. And these, these viruses are, um, they're durable and they're, they're contagious. They're like, this is not something that's hard to get. Uh, yeah, I would say it's uh, uh, the infection rate is really, really high. Yeah. Okay. So basically, yeah. you are going to encounter these viruses. Uh, it's only a question of what the uh, outcome is. In the so the ones that are sexually transmitted, not all of them are. Right. Obviously, when you start to have sex, you will transmit them. So any vaccination program has to start getting people, kids, basically, before they become sexually active. And then as you age, the effectiveness of the vaccine drops off because you're already infected. Right. And yeah. there's a certain age beyond which there's really no benefit of, uh, of being vaccinated in terms of cancer reduction. I, w I want to make one more comment about, about this whole uh, topic because to me, the, the history of our understanding of human papillomaviruses is, is a story about the triumph of science, okay? Because uh, when I started teaching about these in like 1990, there were still individuals out there who were skeptical that a virus, uh, doctors who were skeptical that a virus would actually cause this. I think Zerhausen's um, uh, research was in the 80s. I'm not entirely sure about that. Uh, and not only was it proven that a virus uh, causes this, mm. uh, but uh, that led to 
diagnostic techniques where you could look for viral DNA and that would give you not only uh, an indication of to what your disease was, but what the risk was that it would uh, continue on to be uh, nastier. So it was a good way to tag things and a good way to uh, diagnose things and look at the progress of a disease. And then out of that comes a vaccine because you know what the agent is. And I would right. add that the vaccine is a, uh, made by, uh, it is a protein, ca uh, essentially a protein vaccine, which is actually they produce the virus capsid protein and it assembles into a virus-like particle. And it's produced uh, either in yeast or in a number of other recombinant DNA cell systems. So there is no virus DNA in this thing, okay? It is just protein in the shape of the virus. So it is absolutely as safe as can possibly be. And you will see from uh, this uh, study that we're doing that it's effective. It so works. this is a cancer vaccine, dude. It is mm -hmm. a cancer vaccine. So we have known from many studies that Im HPV immunization decreases the incidence of cervical and anogenital cancers, no question. However, this study is unique in, because Scotland has a way of bringing together a lot of information uh, about uh, patients. Uh, it, it, it combines demographic screening, diagnostic treatment, and immunization data all together. And so you have all these records of cervical cancers in Scotland, and um, they can correlate that with... Uh, with all these other parameters, so I, yeah, I would also in their in their health system, um, they've got, I gather, the whole thing integrated in electronic medical records. Yeah, seems so like that it, you yeah. get the records of the patients who've been screened for cervical cancer. You can look back at you know did this patient receive a vaccine, you know, and and gather these. And they have a procedure, and I'm sure there's a ton of paperwork if you're a researcher wanting to access this, but there's a procedure by which uh, researchers in public health can access those data in an anonymized manner mm -hmm. and submit their protocols, and that's what this paper is. I, I would actually uh, elaborate on this a little bit by saying that uh, it has been clear from the get-go uh, that these vaccines um, uh, prevent... Uh, or lower the incidence of infection by these viruses, uh, that is detectable infection by these viruses, and lowers the incidence of uh, disease manifested as uh, uh, cervical intra... What is it? Uh, cervical intraepithelial yeah, neoplasia, okay? Yes. Which is yeah. not necessarily invasive cancer. That's the kind of uh, mm -hmm. abnormal growth on the cerv uh, cervix that's essentially a flat wart that is diagnosed by uh, a, a pap test. And the thing is that it can take between a diagnosis of that or that showing up and actually cancer, it can be 10 years. So mm -hmm. we've known for a long time that the incidence of cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and, mm. and infection is, is decreased. But we got to wait a long time and, as we have already discussed here, have good tracking to figure out whether it really has uh, the same sort of effect on cancer. You would think that it does, but like all these things, for example, yeah. uh, uh, infections spreading from toilets, it helps to have the data. So here we're going to look at uh, the impact of bivalent vaccine uh, on incidence of cancer by age at immunization and the number of doses received, right? Young, middle, and older, and so forth. So it's the first population-based individual-level data uh, documenting reductions in cancer following the vaccine administration. So again, routinely collected data on all women in Scotland who are eligible for the National Cervical Cancer Screening Program. This is from January, born after January 1st, 88, up until June 2016. Uh, and um, so these are all electronic records. They have 447,955 individual records and in total 234 records of invasive cancer and, and from the Scottish Cancer Registry and the seven records from another uh, registry as well. And so 
they use these data along with immunization records to calculate reductions in incidence of cervical cancer. And any age, there are reductions in incidence following three doses at any age uh, from 8.4 cases per 100,000 in unvaccinated women to 2.3 cases per 100,000 in women re receiving three doses. So that's an effectiveness, 78%, where effectiveness is defined as preventing cervical cancer. Now, if you look uh, at any vaccination at age 12 or 13, zero, zero. per 100,000 persons. So, and then if you do 14, it becomes 3.2 per 100,000. So, um, and they say, you know, we haven't seen any cancers in the 12 to 13, but uh, it's, it's we have small numbers there. So this is they it's were there. vaccinated when they were 12 to 13 years yeah. old. They're much older now. They have zero cases of invasive cancer. Yeah. And as you go up the number of ca cancers, if you vaccinate at a er later age, the number of cancers go up. So uh, in, in the two uh, age 14 to 18 and over 18 combined 29 cases of cervical cancers out of 124,000 uh, individuals. So they were vaccinated too late. Yeah. yeah. Probably. That's yeah. basically it. Uh, 12 to 13. Um, in this paper, um, is there a problem with the colors in figure one? I know most people, it's closed access paper. Most people are not even going to see this, but um, I just, they're talking about uh, red squares, pink squares, light green yeah, squares. Yeah, and yeah, I, 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 yeah, see I, uh, yes. There there's are those no, colors there's in no that green. graph. Yeah, there are. There is a problem. Okay, there. I, don't, I don't see the green. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if a journal editor is listening, you may want to take a look at that. Anyway, also um, they have data on de deprived individuals, right? Yes, and uh, the incidence uh, goes up with deprivation. So yeah, uh, so this is a the deprivation index um, that calculates not just household income but do you are you also living in an area that's got poor services and you mm -hmm. know all this other stuff so there's a there's an index used in in human development circles um, that can measure essentially how disadvantaged somebody is and so the de the most deprived individuals by this index 10.1 cases of cancer per 100,000 per year and the least de deprived 3.9 per 100,000 per year. So deprivation makes an impact as well because you don't get access to health care, clearly. But vaccination helps offset the yeah. significant amount of that, right? Yeah. Yep, sure does. So in the deprived but fully vaccinated, um, you again get reduction in cancer. Actually, I'm thinking back now on, uh, I had to dig back in my memory, uh, your question about why some are higher mm -hmm. risk than others. I think I have asked that question of the experts before, and the theory, I don't know if the, the how much data there is to back this up, is simply that the higher risk dudes have more robust oncogenes, better at turning on the cells. Okay. Yeah. So basically, bivalent vaccine, 12 to 13 years of age, is very effective at preventing cancer. Um, if you are a little bit older, you could still have cancers, and you may even have in, in any vaccinated group cancers caused by other serotypes that aren't in the vaccine. And so they say you still need to have screening. Even if you're vaccinated, you should still have screening periodically uh, to take care of that. Yeah, as a matter of fact, this is uh, the, uh, it's a treatable uh, condition, okay? Uh, yes. The CIN uh, is treatable, yeah. 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 Um, and um, so the screening is, uh, I, would, I was going to say, as important as the vaccination. I don't know if I would put a relative value on that, but it's important. Yeah, you got to do both. Yeah. And uh, to me, uh, the one of the most important findings in this whole thing is the age dependence. Yeah. Yes. Okay? Uh, and that, to be sure... You really have to do it as young as twelve or thirteen years old, yep. uh, and the one of the one of the prominent resistances to this vaccination is that people don't want to think about their little girls uh, having 
having sex, then they say, you know, we don't need this. It's not sexually active. Well, if they're going to be normal, healthy, functioning individuals, they will be eventually. And, uh, you know, uh, you got to get them before that happens. Yeah. All right? Yep. So The other point here in the paper is that whether you had one or two doses, so the two doses are a month apart, at 11, 12, or 13 years of age, you have 100% vaccine effectiveness for, against cancer. So this, they say, supports the move to a one-dose schedule, which has been approved in the UK, and um, it would make it easier, obviously, to get people to do that. So overall, Scotland has 80, the vaccine confers 85% protection against cervical cancers, HPV positive cer cervical cancers. I would assume that, uh, also that these data all come out of, you know, a uh, national health plan of some sort. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So uh, it's another uh, vote of confidence or another piece of evidence that such uh, plans are a good thing. Public health these, is that public health. a lot more yep. friendly than uh, people make it out to be. Yeah. But I, I wanted to just add something to this uh, discussion. Uh, and you'll you'll probably all be ashamed of me for for even talking about it because when I was a postdoc at Rockefeller, just down the hall from where I worked, was uh, Shope, and mm -hmm. uh, Shope was one of the uh, discoverers of this virus, and in fact, uh, he was working in the lab that Peyton Rouse had occupied, and both of those gentlemen died from the same cause, namely pancreatic cancer. Uh, I won't speculate as to whether or not, you know, it was a contagion or not, obviously not, but uh, nobody knows where that virus comes from. But the discussion of whether viruses cause cancer or not was certainly an active um, discussion ongoing as you would meet these people in the hall. You could hear all these conversations and, you know, why didn't I become a virologist? What the hell is wrong with me? I mean, I was surrounded by them. I was, I'm not kidding, and I was even working on an intracellular parasite. I could have easily switched to a, a much smaller version uh, and, and had a, a wonderful life because I can, I can tell you that Harold Varmus was there, lots of other, David Baltimore was there, lots of uh, people who went on to, to great fame and fortune for their contributions. Were, but it worked out okay for you anyway. It went, you know, no complaints. I have no You're complaints. You're on Twitter, Dixon. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really? I mean, I mean we, I'm relearning my, uh, my uh, all these same discussions that we had multiple years ago had no answers, and today they have a lot of answers. And, well, and you, you, you bring up an interesting uh, thread here because uh, in the early days of cancer, I don't think anybody imagined that a virus might cause them. And then a couple of these, like, yeah. Shope and like Rouse, uh, right. a couple of discoveries were made of viruses that seemed to cause cancer. And then there was a, a period of time where we said, oh, viruses cause all cancers. Yeah, exactly. And then, exactly. And then we figured exactly out right. that that wasn't true. So now That's we're right. back to, well, viruses don't really do much. In the That's end, right. the current estimate is that about 20% of cancers mm -hmm. in humans are attributable to viral infections. That's quite remarkable. Yeah. So, so Dixon Shope discovered a rabbit papilloma yeah. virus, not okay. the human papilloma. Oh, Harold yeah. Harold Zuhausen. <laughs> I I don't know. Harold Zuhausen made the association. I don't know if he discovered HPV. Do you know, uh, Rich? I he don't know. Discovered. Okay. But uh, yes, that was important as well. Okay. So um, next, our paper today is in Science Advances: Optimal Trade-Off Control in Machine Learning-Based Library Design with Application to Adeno-Associated Virus AAV for Gene Therapy. So this is not about architecture, Dixon. Library design, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, Vincent, I knew that because uh, I actually read the paper. Well, I thought I read the paper because I didn't understand. Two yeah, good luck. Good luck with reading this paper. This I, is, well, this is, a this tough is not my area. Okay, so this I, is a <laughs> challenge. I, I want to. I just want to pipe up with a couple of thoughts about the readability of this paper. So first of all, it's open access. <laughs> People can go download it. Yeah, that didn't help. Um, <laughs> Secondly, yes, there's a lot about machine learning, and there's even a formula with you know sigma, and and it it, it gets a little hairy in there. But I want to sure I want to call out that the um, the authors I think actually did a pretty good job hmm. with their nutshell summaries. Yeah, there's one yeah. I think there's one up in the introduction, um, 
saying what they why they want to do this and then outlining so basically our procedure is this yeah i think it's good and yeah. and then in the discussion they do it again and they say okay so what we did was this and i i really appreciated that in this paper so if people go and read it you will they'll throw you a life ring occasionally i think yeah. you know there is a there is a a, a popular uh episodic uh space <laughs> adventure which embraces this very very well and and does a good job of explaining it also and that is the uh, the borg uh, hmm. to think about how something adapts and before that you know they're walking among them and they they don't even look at them but eventually they say wait a minute wait a minute there's something wrong here <laughs> and then they share it with every other machine so i think that is the biggest caveat that people have with regards to AI, because A, they don't understand it, and B, they realize that it could actually become smarter than them. And then what are you going to do? And then well, you're we're not these... quite there with that in this no, paper, though. Not yet. Not this yet. paper is a very constrained, specific <laughs> use of. <laughs> so the, um, the f there are three first authors, co-first authors: Dan yeah. Zhangzhu, David Brooks, and Akoswa Busia. And the last author is David Schaffer. This comes from a number of institutions, a lot in California. Berkeley, UCSF. It's all, I think it's all University of California, Berkeley, and University of California, San Francisco. And it's just different departments and institutes okay. within those two. So this is all about adeno-associated viruses, which are widely used and explored as gene delivery vectors, vectors for gene therapy. Right. right? Rich, give us the rundown on AAVs. Okay. Please. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is the... I think maybe the most stripped down DNA virus, maybe the most stripped down virus of all. So we're talking five kilobases of single stranded DNA wrapped in a, uh, a capsid, a, a protein shell, non enveloped. Um, it has just two genes uh, called rep and cap. Rep is a gene that is required for genome replication. You could, you, as you might imagine, if you've been listening, with just two genes, <laughs> you are very dependent on at least the host, if not other things as well, for your replication because you can't encode all the machinery that you need. So this thing, the rep gene, simply uh, essentially directs the attention of the host to this genome, okay, and uses uh, th thereafter the host. Uh, it, it helps with initiation of replication, and the host uh, finishes the job. The cap gene is the capsid. Uh, protein that encapsulates the genome. Um, in culture, at least, uh, this can exist in two uh, modes. It can integrate into the genome, into a very, very specific site in the genome, a single site, and lay there quiescent doing nothing. Um, and uh, certain serotypes, at least, uh, then can be induced to replicate by superinfection with another virus, for example, adenovirus, or uh, in some cases, herpes virus. And this is really because those viruses um, supply some of the functions that are missing in either the cell or the, or the virus itself to replicate, and they uh, cause it to replicate. This is why this thing is called adeno-associated virus, because it was found in association with preparations of adenovirus. Okay? Um, the situation in nature, uh, when last <laughs> I looked seven years ago, was uh, not as clear. I'm not sure that this sort of dual lifestyle with it being integrated. I'm not sure that we, uh, uh, at least I don't understand uh, that completely. Um, but the, the, th the thing is that one of the reasons that this looked attractive initially as a gene therapy vector was because of that highly specific integration. The idea was you could carry a gene to the genome and put it in very reproducibly into an innocuous place. Okay. And not worry and, about it disrupting something essential right. or and, causing cancer because it disrupted an oncogene. Right. It turned out that if you don't have the... Uh, so in order to do this, you basically gut the thing. Um, you um, 
uh, take out both rep and cap and leave only the ends of the genome right. uh, and put in a, a whatever transgene you want, a therapeutic uh, gene. So you only have the ends of the re genome, which signal for uh, uh, copying uh, the genome uh, and for packaging it. Uh, and then you use cell lines that uh, are engineered to supply uh, missing components and transfect this recombinant molecule in that that has your transgene and the AAV genome ends. You transfect it into those cells. Those cells supply the missing components that allow for amplification of that recombinant genome and packaging of it into particles so that you can now purify that and deliver this to uh, whatever you want to to deliver this package of, of genes. It turns out that if you don't have cap and rep, even in culture, the thing does not integrate into that site. Mm. But it also turned out that it will persist as an episome mm -hmm. uh, or uh, an extra, extra chromosomal replicating DNA element uh, indefinitely without any damage to mm. the cell. So what you've basically done is to um, introduce a, a satellite gene into the uh, affected cells that can then express your transgene and do so indefinitely with apparently no downside. Now, the other thing is that is worthy of introduction, uh, by the way, that a lot of this research, most of the research, initial research into engineering this as a gene therapy vector was done by Ken Burns and Nick Musichka uh, at Johns Hopkins and the ultimately the University of Florida. Okay, so, and the University of Florida became a, uh, a site where there was a lot of activity in this regard, though there's activity all over the place now because it is a very popular and potentially effective gene therapy vector. Um, so the other thing is that there are a bunch of different uh, AAV uh, serotypes that have... Uh, uh, can be engineered to have specificity for different receptors, okay? So there is potential for cell targeting of these things, which is a else? very desirable mm -hmm. um, phenomenon, all right? Uh, and there's been a lot of work put into trying to figure out how to engineer <clears throat> the capsid of various AAV serotypes in a fashion that it can be targeted to cells. This is a cumbersome process, uh, and that's what this paper addresses. How do we right. do this so the more usual, efficiently? The usual process to do that is to create a library of AAVs mutated in various ways. Mm -hmm. um, so you take your vector and you, you generate, you hope, as many possible permutations of it as possible, um, and then you... Um, you select from those, okay, does this bind to the cell type of interest? Does it infect? Um, and and that gives you the power of viral genetics to select out from one in 100 million or whatever permutations, um, the one that will hopefully do what you want it to do. And there are licensed AAV vectors. For example, there's one for blindness uh, of a certain type that is injected into the retina and restores uh, vision. So they, they work well. But as you've heard, there are limitations. They don't infect a lot of different organs, particularly muscle and brain, where you want to deliver genes. Uh, and so people have tried to make different capsid, as Alan said, by mutating the genomes in various ways. But as they say in the introduction, much of these libraries is wasted. You make yes. a lot of mutations, most of which are not getting into viruses. A lot of them don't even package their yeah. genome properly. So you've just got all these dead end mutants sitting there in your library, and you've got, oh, wow, we got, you know, 10 to the 7th mutants, but only mm -hmm. 10 to the 4th of them are actually right. useful. So yeah. obviously, you'd like more. <laughs> so they said, well, could we use machine learning to design better libraries? that we would then use to infect a certain cell type and pull out mm. viruses that can reproduce in them. So that's what this is about. And they actually develop uh, machine learning algorithms to do that, design the libraries, and they test them. And it, 
it looks pretty good. <laughs> Looks yeah. like they, they can make better libraries than the existing ones. You know, there's an existing standard library. It's called NNK, uh, and um, they try and improve on it. So uh, that's what this is about. So I the reason I picked this paper, I always get asked, will AI benefit virology? And here's an example, because I, as Alan told me earlier, ML is basically AI, right? Sure, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they um, they make a, a standard library, um, and what this is involving, uh, there is um, one of the captured, the captured protein um, has an area that can tolerate seven amino acid insertions, and these have been shown to alter the specificity of, of the vector. For example, it's, it's this area is associated with uh, receptor binding and uh, and cell entry, which is a big limitation in getting into uh, a lot of different cells. And they make uh, an NNK library by the standard methods. And you know, over half of these, as Alan said, they don't package. So basically, his yeah, is it's a not good quite as bad as I, I think I said ten to the seventh, and then you yeah. only get ten to the fourth. It's not that bad, but it's like half of your library. But here's good. the thing that I want to read. They write, much of the experimental library is wasted on poor fitness variants. I mean, that's it. They're all not fit. So let's get rid of them. Let's make a, a more fit library. So they what they do is they make this NNK library. It's So this is, D, these are DNAs. They package them, uh, and then uh, they um, infect cells. And harvest the viruses and compare the sequences before and after infection. And so this NNK, um, initially I thought, oh, what does NNK stand for? And then finally they explain. I tell you, yeah. Um, so it refers to um, the three uh, three bases that are going to form, you know, tell you what amino acid to put there. And so in making your library, you structure it so that you have any base any base, and then K is an abbreviation meaning either a G or a T, right? Right, right. Um, so NNK means that you've done that kind of engineering to produce to, on right, this right. seven amino acid stretch. And the reason they use a G or a T in the third space is to minimize the um, the rate at which you get a stop code on. Right. Because you don't want a stop code right. on in the middle of your capsid. That's obviously going to be a problem. Um, so then they, taking that as the way they build their seven mer. They then come up with a machine learning approach to figure out, you know, should it really be any base, any base, or should we like bias these bases mm -hmm. in one mm -hmm. direction or another to prevent certain combinations of amino acids that are right. um, and, that are not going to work? And the in the way they so you have to train these machine learning algorithms with data. So what they do is they make DNA, like 10 to the seventh variants in your NNK library, they package them into virus particles, and then they sequence the DNA before and after packaging. And they say, what doesn't get into particles? And they feed that into their algorithm. Which bombers didn't come back? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> exactly. Good analogy. It's exactly I like right. that. That's exactly right. So basically, they, have a, they test a number of different machine learning models. They pick one. In the end, that's that's which they think is the best. It's called NN one hundred, and then they use that to validate it. They use this model to say predict sequences, insertions of seven MERS. Right? They packaged. They they make the DNAs predicted by this model. They package them, and here I want to point out, dear authors that you cannot titer a virus, all right? You can <laughs> determine the titer or titrate it. Titer is not a verb, okay? They titrate these particles, uh, and then they sequence them. And um, they find that they get better packaging with the ML-guided Much larger proportion of the library is packageable. All right. Yeah. So th th you get a better library than the NNK. and it's also as diverse as the NNK. Right. You don't want to have restricted diversity, right? It says diverse. Right. It wasn't just that they eliminated what wouldn't package, and now you're making half the library. 
you're you're getting the full size library and it's just as diverse as they mathematically demonstrate here right um but you've you've eliminated a lot of those unpackageable ones and they actually designed three different uh, machine learning based libraries they're called d1 d2 and d3 and they compare them and try and figure out which of them they should proceed with because they want to do some actual experiments um they end up picking uh what is it d3 um and um so a little bit of information on this uh so um they they <laughs> it's, a, it's a very interesting discussion of um how to make better libraries and they basically say there are two kinds of libraries. You can make an unconstrained or a constrained library. So uh, in other words, unconstrained, you would use any 21 base pair sequence to make these seven mer amino acids that you're going to stick in, right? Um, but they don't do that because it's too expensive <laughs> to make all those oligos. So they make a constrained library, which is a subset, and it's just cost effective. But they say... If costs were not an issue, and we figure in someday cost will not be an issue because oligosynthesis gets cheaper and cheaper, then not because not because science gets more funding, but because oligosynthesis yes. gets. Then you would use an unconstrained approach because that makes the best libraries. They they conclude by their modeling, but we can't do that now because it's uh, it's too expensive. Okay. So, so Vincent, <laughs> let me ask you this: a, a fundamental question here is that eventually they're trying to target the cells that are out of control in a patient. Right. And they're trying to get the virus. Well, that's particle. one approach. That's cancer, or to replace a gene that's missing. Or to replace a gene that's missing. So, right. with with the cancer uh, approach to trying to eliminate it by using uh, an adeno like or an adeno. Uh, yeah, the helper virus. Adeno-associated virus. Adeno-associated virus. When, when the virus or when that infectious unit enters a cell eventually and starts to replicate as the result of taking advantage of all the host no, machinery. There's that's no there, replication. There's no replication. No, there's no replication. If this they're thing missing goes that the gene. There's no okay. rep gene, which you need to initiate okay. replication. Okay, 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 yeah. okay, okay, okay. okay. And so this right. DNA goes in the nucleus and it just stays okay. there. It actually recombines okay. with itself and makes forms that are episomally stable. Okay. And, uh, it and so the replicate. gene is in there. The gene that you added is in there, but, you but only in the that cell gene. that got no that got that took in that virus. That virus cannot get out. But that DNA is transcribed, and you make mRNAs, and they make the protein that you need. Yeah, but that's just one cell making that process. Yes, so, it's, so, it's so you want good to enough. right. Which is a limitation of gene therapy, because if you have a condition that is um, where the the mutant form of whatever gene causes the problem, right? Um, then you're not going to be able to fix that with gene therapy unless you can get the replacement gene into 100 percent of the cells. Yeah, well, which that's isn't right. going to happen. That, well, that's why muscul um, muscular dystrophy failed. Whereas, a, right, a, an easier thing to tackle is a condition where a patient is lacking a gene, right? our gene product, and that's causing the problem. And some dose of that that doesn't require 100% of the cells producing it um, would allow you to overcome the condition or to mitigate yeah. the condition. Yeah. So the latest uh, approval was for a, a genetic-based uh, blind uh, condition, which mm -hmm. could be addressed with this therapy. Yes, it is. It's a drug called Luxturna. It's an AAV containing a gene that's missing in people with this right. Lauber's congenital uh, blindness. And it's injected into the retina directly. Oof. Put a needle in the front of the eye right into the retina. I'm sure they use anesthesia. I'm and certain that they it do. restores vision. <laughs> and it's that's like remarkable. half a million dollars per eye is what the drug costs. Wow. But it restores your vision. That's today. Tomorrow it's amazing. will be. <laughs> well, yeah, the price always goes up because what is it worth for you to see, right? Right. Anyway, they make two libraries. They go through and synthesize the DNA based on this ML prediction. They package them. And this is very cool. Only 0.2 to 0.5% of the variants are shared with the NNK library. It's a totally different. Totally different library. Library. <laughs> it's amazing. And you might say, well, may maybe it's no good. They actually go through and 
make sure it's okay. It is okay. It's it's fit. It's diverse. It is just different from NNK because here it is predicted by uh, some information that you've uh, fed to a program. Um, and they um, they get better packaging as well than the NNK library, about five-fold higher packaging. Um, Which they, is what they built it to fix. They built it to fix. Uh, and the, the, the titer is... Um, is higher, so the packaging reflects the tighter, of course. The tighter is higher as well because you get better packaging. So um, they they have now made these libraries that look better. So let's test them, all right? Let's see if they can perform in some kind of selection. So AAVs don't typically infect neuronal cells, right? So they take some human, uh, primary human brain tissue and culture, fresh, Surgically resected adult cortical tissues from epilepsy patients put in cell culture dishes and they infect with the, the two libraries, the NNK and the one, uh, I guess they, they've used D2. Uh, that's one of the three that they made here. They harvest the tissues uh, and they find um, a, a number of variants that emerge from their library that have uh, an ability to infect these cells. Tenfold higher post-brain infection, infection uh, ability compared to the NNK library. Here's the thing. Here's what's cool. In the D2 library, you infect um, brain cells, and then you take what comes out. In the D2 library, the machine learning generated library, you get 38,350 different variants that can infect those cells. With the NNK in an L or an NNK library, you get 3,500. Tenfold better. Tenfold more variants that can infect this. That tissue. can infect brain yeah. cells. And you don't know which of those is going to be right. So having more is better, right? That's cool. <laughs> yeah. And and so they, they're wondering, you know, why is this? And they say, well, one of the things we notice is a little bit of a depletion of threonine and serine in this seven mer that we stuck in compared to the NNK library. And they say these amino acids are known to reduce the ability of AAV vectors to infect cells. And so the ML design has reduced those because it figured out that <laughs> they weren't good. It's very cool. Um, let's see, what else is interesting from this? Um, So again, the diversity of this library is great. They studied that in pretty much in pretty detail, um, and then um, oh yeah, yeah so, so this they, is cool. these are the, these end up being uh, glial targeting. They're targeting glial cells in the brain, right? Uh, which they say they previously couldn't get variants that would do that, right? So they infect with their D two library, and then they extract the genomes, the viral genomes that can enter glial cells, and they sequence them to say uh, what what's going on here. And they can see uh, variants that infect the glial cells the best, um, and they, um, they, they reintroduce these into glial cells, and they put a green fluorescent protein marker in the vector to show that you can get a good fraction of the cells uh, infected with that particular vector. So you get high titer, and... Um, a lot of cells, high levels of infection across multiple regions of the primary brain tissue when you immunostain them. So basically, this is one application, a glial cell, but you could do it. Imagine, make a library and use any kind of selection that you're looking for. You want it to replicate in muscle. You put it in muscle cells. You pull out lots of variants. You characterize them and see which one is the best. I mean, it's a lot of work, obviously, but that's how you make vectors. Yep. I think this is very cool. <laughs> right? I, think, I think it's an awesome approach, yeah. You know, wh when <laughs> at what point does this stop being a virus and start being just, you know, a tool? I think it already has. Yeah. I think it because it's not the the final virus that you make can't replicate. Right. It can't get out of the cell. It's really I mean it's a transfection tool. Yeah. It's amazing. They say we Developed glial targeting capsid variants, which we had previously been unable to do. Yep. So there's where AI can help folks. Yep. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. 
Yeah, I like this very much. It's good, and it, and as a, it is nicely explained. I mean the 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 algorithms and the formulas are not as easy, but you don't really need to no. understand those to see what's going on here. I think uh, yeah. there were uh, several vocabulary words in here that were not <laughs> not specifically science vocabulary words. Words that I had to look up. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stuart Schumann would love this. He always likes to slip in some obscure English word. I had to, I had to send him this paper uh, just to, uh, for that purpose. What Really? He puts those in his papers? Oh, yeah. Give me an example. Um, you, you remember? Yeah. Um, he <laughs> once described the uh, vaccinia virus capping enzyme as being perspicacious. Okay. <laughs> nice. Very good. All right. His challenge was always, anytime he gave a talk or wrote a paper, his challenge was to make me go scrambling for a, a, a dictionary. A dictionary. <laughs> I hope he didn't write his grants like that. Uh, he did. <laughs> he did? Oh, yeah. But it's beautiful. He writes beautifully. Oh. You know, the occasional vocabulary challenge is good. Dixon, let's do a couple of emails. Dixon, can you take the first one? I can. As soon as I can get the email area back up on my screen. And yes, Melissa writes, good morning, Twiv team. I was wondering if Dixon would be able to direct me to where I can get a copy of his book, West Nile's Story. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and Vince, I looked it up too, and it's still active on Amazon. Yep. So you can buy a copy of it. And Gee, I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> pleased to learn that somebody else is interested in uh, that that's story that, that was so... Um, <laughs> a lot of fun to work on, and uh, probably still is. Uh, Alan, can you take the next? Sure. Nelly writes, Dear all, in TWIV 1073, you discussed that no ethics committee would agree to a study where infected animals are fed to another species to demonstrate <laughs> virus transmission through carnivorism. <laughs> I remembered that Thies Quicken from Erasmus Medical Center once told me about a study that he had conducted that included infecting chickens with avian influenza viruses and feeding them to cats. Provides a link to the paper. Greetings from a constantly raining Gottingen, rainy Gottingen in Germany. Yeah, we experimentally inoculated cats with H5N1 and fed them to... Wait, no, uh, they inoculated chickens, right? They, yeah, so they got virus-infected chickens. Yeah. Right. Wait, we inoculated oh, we, cats... Oh, right, they inoculated cats... Intrath intratracheally and yeah, by yes. feeding them virus infected chickens. Two separate experiments, I assume. Yes. Wow. And what was the result? Uh, Cats excreted they virus. <laughs> they got lung disease and they transmitted transmitted it to sentinel cats. Uh, Thank you, Nelly. <laughs> sentinel cats are hard to find. Usually they just don't pay attention. I thought I thought I saw one go across Rich's lap before though. Oh uh, yeah, I've yeah, got one my, on the desk right now. That's to my me. sentinel cat. She had her antenna up. <laughs> Rich, can you take the next one? Brian writes, uh, "Twiv, so enjoyed the discussion of Merrick's disease virus and fitness. Thank you. Perhaps the discussion of fitness struggles because we confuse a selection force such as competition with a selection outcome uh, such as more virions produced." All selection outcomes are, by definition, fit, fitness-related. Both selection and fitness are defined as differential reproductive success, i.e. one genome gaining presence in the next generation. Selection forces are, of course, different, as a selection force virulence acts on hosts. If it involves a metabolic cost to the virus, then increased metabolism is the selection force. However, there may be more than just one selection, uh, even drift here. A tetrapro, the tetraproline's levels gradual ratchet-like reduction results in more uh, virulence. It may be that this repeat sequence is unstable or especially mobile or is difficult for the MEQ domain to maintain because of its ionic electrostatic aspects. Over time, its maintenance may require selection, not its loss. But one cannot say selection has caused the ratchet if the ratchet is entropic. Brian, I have to say that this, I wasn't present for that 
um, episode, and uh, you guys may have some comment on this. It goes over my head. No, we were arguing that it all. So the the, the apparent increase in Marek virulence over the years is not because virulence is selected for, but you select for a more fit virus. Okay. So it's fitness, which is the actual selection force. And he says here, all f selection outcomes are by definition fit fitness related. And so it's okay. just a matter of what other things can be affected. So we're, we're basically agreeing, but he's saying that this, in the paper, they, they argue that there was a tetraproline repeat in one of the proteins that was reduced over the years and it resulted in an increase in virulence. And I argued that there was some other selection going on, but he's saying here, basically it could be a random thing. Maybe it's not stable and, and so forth. So uh, yes, I agree. The selection is not necessarily causing that uh, tetraproline to, to change in size. That's what it's about. Yeah, that's good, Brian. Thank you. Um, uh, April writes, the re Hi, Twifteen. The reason people are asking about preeclampsia, so a couple of episodes ago, people were asking about this, is that many medical professionals in hospitals are not treating pregnant people for preeclampsia until it's life-threatening because of the laws against abortion. Many pregnant people who have pregnancy complications and want to have their baby are being turned away from hospitals because medical professionals are afraid of prosecution. Ugh. Okay. Right. Yep, I think that's probably correct, although I don't know. Yep. Let me get do the next one from Anthony, who writes, There is significant international trade in live chickens and prevent, uh, presents a link for that. This reflects from production through heterosis, resulting in a pyramidal structure of the global industry. There's a word I need to look up. Does anybody know what that means? Heterosis. Nope. Heter heterosis. The tendency of a crossbred individual to show qualities superior to those of both parents. Hybrid vigor. Hybrid vigor. Thank you, Anthony. Um, let's do another round. Dixon, can you take the next one? You'll need to unmute. <laughs> we could read his lips, right? I need to unmute. <laughs> Tatiana writes, Dear Twift team, my name is Tatiana Marino. And I'm an instructor and junior researcher at the virology section of the Faculty of Microbiology of the University of Costa Rica. I would like to thank you very much for keeping me updated in virology news and scientific publications, which has been very useful for my classes. Also, thanks to TWIV, I was able to hear about the ASV Global Scholarship Award, for which I played and got it. So now I will be able to attend the ASV 2024 medium in Columbus, Ohio. Keep up the good work and the advocacy for vaccination. Muchas gracias y pura vida, Tachana. That's great. We'll see you cool. at ASV. Very yeah. good. Yes. Rich, uh, Alan, you're next, I think, right? Yeah. Uh, yes. Odie writes, weekly listener of TWIV. I'm a layperson, but closely follow TWIV and COVID developments. I have several risk factors for COVID, including asthma and obesity. I also have a child with the same risk factors both fully vaccinated, of course. We are still COVID conscious and mask indoors in public and only see family indoors with testing and HEPA filters. These days, we seem to be the only ones taking these precautions. As experts, are you still recommending masking in public? Doesn't it make sense to do so for those at high risk? My primary concern is not the acute infection, but long COVID, for which there is no real treatment, so basically avoiding it like the plague. Would love to hear your thoughts on masking and testing and how you make these decisions in your personal lives, as well as what you recommend to patients. Thanks, Odie. Um, we don't have any patients. <laughs> we don't have any patients, no. Uh, but I do know that people who care for patients, such as my wife, um, are now masking up again. Um, a lot of hospital systems and clinics have gone back to mandatory masking, and those that haven't um, take a pretty, uh, pretty aggressive approach to uh, promoting masking. Um, so that's not gone. Uh, and you know, your I, I caution is not a bad idea, right? I mean, if you have comorbidities and you're concerned yeah. about this, 
uh, yeah, being vaccinated is great, um, but not being exposed is pretty good too. Uh, and um, you know, it's I depending on where you live, I understand that it could be difficult and people could react to you badly if you're going around in a mask. But I know around here, I have been seeing people in the supermarket in masks, um, you know, including some of the cashiers. And that's fine. That's uh, people have to kind of make their own decisions about what they're comfortable with. Um, And I do know, um, this is anecdotal, but there's also some data behind it. Uh, I'm, I'm involved with a local ham radio club. And we have observed a very clear difference in our attendance levels at meetings and at other events um, pre and post pandemic, if we are indeed post pandemic, uh, you know, and people are saying, well, why, is, why aren't people showing up for the meetings? And a lot of people, members of the group who would have gone to a meeting in the past don't now because they don't want to be in a closed space with 50 other people. Mm-hmm. So you're you're not wrong to do these things. Um, I Personally, I'm not doing any of them, but I, I don't have the same risk factors. Yeah, I think that if you are, have a risk factor for severe disease, definitely mask. That's fine, especially now in winter when it's the season. Case numbers yep. are up. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one? Kate writes, hi, Vincent. According to the discussion of measles vaccines and getting back, adding to the discussion of measles vaccines and getting vaccinated if you can. The MMR is a live virus vaccine and thus contraindicated in immunocompromised patients. This creates a double whammy. The patient can't get vaccinated and if they get measles are likely to become very, very sick. So they depend on those around them to be vaccinated to create that herd immunity that keeps them safe. As a mother of a child with a liver transplant, thanks to everyone that does get vaccinated, it really matters that you are protecting more than just your own health. Kate, well said. Couldn't be said better. Very well done. All right, Charles writes, hello, Twiver. Some interesting picks from Twiv1081. For Dixon's pick... I have a suggestion for those of you who have birthdays before 1960 and grew up in the New York or Philadelphia areas, as my partner Marie did. It's a documentary about the Automats, Horn and Hard Art in particular. Automatmovie.com. I grew up in Kentucky and had no experience with Automats beyond the movies. Marie's grandmother would take her to Horn and Hard Art on occasion, and she had fond memories. As a computer programming uh, programmer, I have a great interest in AI. I am not an AI expert. I hope you can find one to interview. Sorry, I cannot help with that effort. As noted, AI is here to stay, and it can be a powerful tool. As with most tools, it can be and will be abused. Also, as noted, it takes some skill to get good results. For a while now, I have been saying there will be a new job created by AI. This new job will be AI Whisper. I think Brianne was on the edge of saying something like this. As a poor writer, whisperer, thank you. As a poor writer, AI can be of assistance to me. Banning it for students, I think, would be counterproductive. Let people use the tools that they will have access to in the real world, in the classroom, after they have a basic understanding of the subject. Think how crazy it would be to try to ban calculators today. Thanks, Charles. Yeah, I agree with that. Go for it. And then he has an, he says, you may like this version from the Google AI Bard better. So I presume this one was written by... <laughs> written by Bard. <laughs> by, uh, the first one maybe was written by ChatGPT or maybe by him. I don't know. Um, let's see how this goes. Hey, Twiv family. I wonder what he told Bard to do. <laughs> <laughs> Dixon's pick on Automat sparked a nostalgic memory lane trip for me and probably some of you. If you, like my partner Marie, grew up in pre-1960 New York or Philly, this documentary about Horn and Hard Art's iconic automats will bring back warm, clinking nickel memories. Okay, what human would ever write that? <laughs> <laughs> clinking Somebody nickel. Somebody who works in advertising. <laughs> anyway, the, you could read the rest of it. Right. The last sentence is, thanks for sparking these thoughts, Twiv crew. <laughs> Keep the fascinating pics coming. A lot of exclamation marks in the Bard version. Yeah. yeah. It's very enthusiastic. 
It is. It is quite. quite. All right. Uh, 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 <laughs> Vincent. Yes. Uh, there's no email here about in any sort of reaction to my pick from last week about uh, evolution and diet. Has, ah. has there been no traffic in that regard? I was kind of hoping it. Uh, I was kind of hoping that somebody would write in. It didn't. No, but it could be delayed. I haven't seen any yet. Okay, because I even patient. got an email from Neva saying uh, you're going to get mail <laughs> on this topic because diet is a hot topic. Okay, be patient. Good we'll see. It is a button that needs to be pushed. <laughs> Time for some picks. Dixon, yep. what do you have this week? Uh, well, I stumble on this because I got sidetracked in surfing the internet, of course, uh, and I ran across a video of a truck that had, oh, maybe 40 wheels, and it had three sections to it, and on top was a uh, a small section of rail, and on top of that, of course, was a locomotive. And this truck's job was to transport this locomotive across that washed-out river. Uh, or washed-out road, I should say. The, the road was clearly 10 feet below the level of the truck. Uh, but the truck had a special cab in the front. And this the cab could lower itself without lowering the rest of the machinery. And then it would drive slowly, and a couple of wheels would come over the edge. And, and I, 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 I just got wrapped up in it. The guy got the damn thing across the river with no spilling of anything. <laughs> you know, I expected the locomotive to go over. That was what they were showing this for. But in essence, the, the transports worked. Well, I didn't have time to change it off and to go back to what I was looking at. So the next one came up. I said, what the heck, as long as I'm here, I might as well watch this too. So this one was the one that I picked because it depicted a a slight of build person, a woman in this case, in a rural area of some part of Southeast Asia, which I would guess would be Vietnam, but I'm not sure. And she was surrounded by her um, domesticated fowl, which she was trying to provide a better life for. <laughs> of course, as you can imagine, at the end, it's because she wanted to eat them. Uh, but she would never tell them that because... What she really wanted to do is she wanted to build a little ducky pond. And so she sets about harvesting bamboo and other larger trees to construct all by herself, without a plan, with a one little saw. In real time, you can watch this video and you will be astounded at what this person accomplished in a very short period of time. She not only Oh, she had a tape measure also. That was her other uh, technological <laughs> aid. And she had this little hand saw, which look, looks very clumsy to work with. But she was cutting bamboo like crazy, and she was splitting. And she made a perfect barrier dam, which didn't exactly hold back all the water. But it created enough deep water. And the ducks, they must have, in quack language, thanked her profusely because... <laughs> <laughs> they were quacking all over the place, and they were running. And look, 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 there's more water. We can now swim. And, you know, because this was not that big a river. It was an, a, a little rivulet. I can't imagine what would happen, though, during a downpour, because it would probably wash the whole thing away. But, but she built it from scratch in about 20 minutes. I highly recommend it. It is, I, I expected it to have a disastrous ending, but it added a very peaceful ending and her little ducks were thrilled absolutely thrilled wait till they get eaten well they don't they don't know that now do they They won't be aware of that <laughs> they do not maybe she's just saving the eggs i don't know but i do know that uh this is a remarkable example of what a single person who is absolutely driven to succeed can do given the right motivation and I think it's very inspirational to see. And I, I thought that I could share this with everybody. Cool. There's a simpler address to this, I have no doubt. <clears throat> but if you click on this large thing. Yeah, uh, I'll put a simpler uh, address yeah. in here. It's I would easy. title this Busy as a Beaver or The Power of One. Thank you, Dixon. 
You're welcome. Yeah, Rich, what do you have for us? I have a book I recently read called Gator Country, Deception, Danger, <laughs> and Alligators in the Everglades by Rebecca Renner. I have no idea where I got this. This wasn't a pick before, was it? <laughs> we don't know. I don't no? believe I don't so, so, no. I don't know. I don't know who sent me this. I don't know how I encountered this. Uh, but, uh, I've, but at any rate, uh, I would say uh, that this is a book uh, about ecology, really of uh, Florida, in particular, South Florida, in particular, the Everglades. Uh, the author, Rebecca Renner, grew up in Florida, uh, has uh, an interest in, you know, natural history and et cetera. Uh, and, you know, superficially, the book is about poaching, uh, in particular, uh, poaching in the alligator trade, which means uh, harvesting alligators illegally, or more importantly, alligator eggs because alligator farming is a business. Alligators don't reproduce in captivity. So the uh, farming business is dependent on harvesting eggs. And this is regulated so that uh, we don't run out of alligators. Uh, and there are uh, poachers who violate the regulations. And so the, the real narrative here is about uh, an undercover operation to break up a poaching um, uh operation uh, that's really well written. But uh, in a broader sense, it's about the ecology in Florida and uh, uh, about how this is not all black and white. The gators were all fine until hmm. the developers moved in and then the gators started to disappear, but everybody blamed the poachers, all right? But the poachers probably don't have anywhere near as the impact as the developers do. It reminds me of, I used to study sea otters when I was an undergraduate in California. And uh, the abalone fishermen blamed the sea otters for tra uh, trashing the abalone fishing, which was just not the case at all. They were fishing themselves out of business. Mm -hmm. That didn't prevent them from shooting the otters. Okay, So it's a very good read, and it's a really nice description of the ecology in South Florida and also a little mystery story or detective story about this undercover poaching operation. A first cool. book for Rebecca Renner, I think, who's one of these people who always wanted to be a writer, and uh, she's succeeding. Cool. Great. Thank you. Alan, what do you have? I also have a book pick. Um, this is a very different subject. Um, so this is um, a book called Strange Bedfellows by Ina Park. And... Um, it's all about sexually transmitted infections. No, wait, wait, wait. It's fun. Um, <laughs> I, I don't recommend giving this book as a gift, but I do, I do highly recommend reading it. Um, she's, first of all, she knows what she's talking about. She's a, um, an infectious disease doc who has specialized in STIs for, I don't know, a decade or more. Um, so she really knows her stuff. But more importantly, she is hilarious <laughs> this i mean this is such a fun read um she's a good writer and just so fun um you know just as a an example i can give on the show um because there are many that i couldn't um she's uh, at one point she was discussing uh how sexually transmitted infections um the obviously any infection spreads through some kind of contact in a in a network of individuals Right. So an important aspect of STIs is is mapping the sexual network of the individuals who are being infected. She talks about how different network structures would make a big difference in one's probability of getting infected. So instead of just making up names, she uses Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and constructs two different sexual networks as examples, you know, so if. <laughs> <laughs> if Dopey is sleeping with Doc and Snow White and, and Grumpy is sleeping and, and just, you know, but uh, but if these are concurrent versus sequential, it makes a big difference. Um, so it's stuff like that and and a lot of stuff that, you know, I had no idea. The, the whole thing about sexual networks, I've ne never really given much thought to. Um but it's a fascinating subject, and the way this all plays out, and of course the stigma associated with STIs is part of the problem in many cases, um, and just a, a really good read. Wow. 
I love the cover. Yes, the cover is <laughs> is consistent <laughs> with the humor inside. No, I would never Excellent. thought of that. I'll have to uh, see if my library is How this new. Is it? Probably new, right? How big is a sexual network? It could be small or large. It could right? be small yeah. or large. It could be two people, or it could be two thousand. Yeah. Um, okay. And she, in fact, she talks about um, uh, what was it? A, um, it wasn't HIV. She does she does have a chapter on HIV, of course, and how the dynamics of that changed drastically as mm. treatments came along online. Um, but um, I think it was. I think it might have been syphilis, um, and she gives examples of a, a sexual networks of two different people, two different patients who she saw, um, one of whom had it and another of whom didn't, and they're not, like the, the one who had it had two sexual partners, the one who mm. didn't had like 30, but the structure of their sexual networks was very different in such a way that the one you wouldn't expect was actually at higher risk than you, the one you would expect because mm. of the way the relationships were operating. Hmm. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. All right. My, my pick is a very simple kit that you can buy for $11. I was cleaning out the other day and I found Ooh. that you can, it's a, it's a called star and sphere. Okay. And you can build a star or you can build a, a sphere, sphere, which really is a virus. It's an icosahedral like structure so you can <laughs> see what a virus looks like and it's very simple it has all these little sticks of different lengths and then it has um these connectors that you stick the sticks they're just circles with holes in them oh yeah actually there are no holes in them they're just very um soft kind of rubbery thing and then you stick the sticks in <laughs> it has instructions so you could build a star as you can see here, or you can, I would say you should build the uh, the thing that looks more like a virus. And I'm going to build this, so next time we'll. All right, I was going we'll to ask. How you many how many different shapes can you make with that? Well, I bet you could build a lot. It, here it has uh, instructions for two, but uh, you could build lots of things. And, and the, the virus is 20 inches in diameter, so it's a nice substantial virus. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those Mimi, Mimi viruses? <laughs> no, this, uh, well, you know, it is, huh, it's no, it's, big. it's, it could be. Um, anyway, there's other stuff uh, here, Alan, as you see other kits. Yeah. So if you, something is a little odd about the particular page, they have that kit listed on, and I don't know if they discontinued that kit or something, but if you click any of the other links on that page, uh -huh. they don't quite work. However, if you strip back the URL and go to the main page, icoso.com, right. um, oh, then you get all their kits and presumably things work. Got it. Yeah, it's an interesting... And they have yeah. other icosahedral things you can buy, just the sphere kit. Oh, yeah. I can see that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they have other stuff too, and uh, you might want to explore that. And it's yeah. a company in Eugene, Oregon, made in the right. USA. You just might get one for my grandson. It's pretty cool. Check it out. It's this this one that I just showed you is eleven bucks. Can't beat it. It's not bad. Well, it was eleven bucks when it was listed. Right. I'm actually. <laughs> yeah, you may want to um, come back to this site or something. I'm getting a lot of URL not found. Yeah, this the, the original thing you put up, or you could email the guy Chris at ecoso dot com. That's probably the way to go. And say well, I want a virus. And he <laughs> says he'll say to you. Just don't wear a mask. That's just, right. Just go read the book that Alan picked. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Expand your network. All That's right. right. It's, it's TWIV 1083. Show notes are at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. Picks of the week. Happy to get those. TWIV at microbe.tv. Uh, and if you enjoy our work on these programs, please support us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dix and De Palmier is at trichinella.org and the, li the living river.org. Thank you, Dixon. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, it was an all male crew today. I kind of missed the female voice yes. every now and then, but uh, it was fun. Yes. Kathy uh, fun. dropped out at the last minute. 
Not too bad. Saying she had too much work to do. And she said- We really could have used Kathy with the AAV yeah, paper. Yeah, she said, you'll probably pick a paper I would have liked. And I said, yeah, actually we did. <laughs> yeah, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Sorry about that. Alan Dove she can is write at, in and correct everything we screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> Alan Dove is at alandove.com, turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville. He's currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.